So the history of our civilization is also a history of materials, from iron and stone to steel, silicon, and plastics. It's been about trying to find the right options to solve the problems of today, but also to give us the resilience to tackle the problems of the tomorrow. It's the right tool in the toolbox, it's the right materials for the job. Now, for the last 150 years, we've had the periodic table, which has done just that. It's allowed us to understand the relationship between the elements in that periodic table. And it's also predictive. And in fact, only two weeks ago, we've added four more elements. These are the heaviest elements to the periodic table. So it's more than just a table. It's a predictive tool. But when we now have these 96 available natural occurring elements, we can combine them in over 10 million ways to create existing materials. So the periodic table is only a small part of the whole vast materials map that's available to us. But there's a lot more. We believe that you can combine these elements together to produce at least 100 times more new materials, new smart materials, new composite materials, but also unknown materials, the unknown unknowns, where we don't even know what the properties will be. The trouble is that this is a vast materials universe to explore, and it will take about a billion lifetimes to really go through it properly. The need to identify new materials has never been a greater resource for the human beings. Sooner rather than later, we're going to run out of the sort of elements that we need to make the right tools that we have at the moment, and add to resource scarcity also the issues of climate change, population increase, and energy um, problems. So some of the materials that are those right jobs are going to not be available. They're going to be too scarce, too expensive, or too resource um, intensive. We're going to need new materials that are going to be made with cheaper energy and also with available resources. But what about those materials that we don't know of, those unknown unknowns? We need a way to find those efficiently without relying just on experiment. And that's where computer simulation comes from. We can actually start to predict these new materials, even those ones that we haven't anticipated yet. We're already using computers, high-performance computers, to do lots of interesting jobs for us. We're losing it to look at climate change. We're looking at the human genome. We're even starting to understand some of the complexities of the brain. And yes, we're also getting better weather forecasts as well. Well, at least slowly. However, what we really want to do with the computer simulation is not just getting these materials faster, but also understanding the interconnectivity of those properties. Computer simulation allows us to understand a set of different properties. Small compositional changes to these materials make very great differences to their properties. And when you add on to that the way that materials behave at the atomic scale, well, actually, that gets really interesting indeed. Understanding the dynamic properties of materials using the power of computer simulation, that's the focus of my research group at Imperial College. And dynamics really matter. They alter the properties of materials and they alter their performance. And you've heard a little bit about that already. One of the areas that I work in here was seeing radiation damage to a specific material. This is a material inside a nuclear reactor whose properties degrade with time due to that radiation damage. We've been able to understand the atomic scale processes that go on in this material and thus design new materials which are better at the atomic scale in terms of things like nuclear waste. But those atomic scale processes are only part of the story. We need to understand what they do to properties and then scale that up to the whole material and in fact actually to the whole product. Usually we've been doing those sorts of predictions um, separately. What we need is to bring that together. Furthermore, we need to bring that together with experiment. Experiment's great at testing the predictions of the model. It's also great at challenging us to have greater, more fidelity in our computer simulations. And the computer simulations can also help to lead and understand where the, nuclear, uh, where the experimental data is going. So computer simulation is giving us already benefits, but we've got a long way to go. To predict the um, materials at the uh, atomic scale, we also need to understand those macroscopic properties properly. Experimental work tells us if the computer is right, but in the end, we have to be able to test them. So, it's more about resilience. It's about the way we adapt to our changing world. It's about re-engineering industry and addressing resource scarcity. That's what computer simulation, in partnership with experiment, can do. So my question to you is how should policy 
makers, material scientists, and industry work together to ensure that we have the materials that we need, the materials options for the future we really want. Thank you.